Uh, hi, everybody. I am Clue Williams. Uh, this is Trojan Horse Narratives, Sneaking in Queer Stories. So I'm really going to come off of a lot of stuff you just heard, which is really exciting. I'm super happy to be on a panel with these guys. And Heidi, congratulations on the upcoming publication. It's really exciting. So um, my name is Clue Williams, and this is some of my work. I was going to put my face up there, but you don't need it twice. It's fine. This is live. Uh, so you can tell I'm really into glitch. We're going to circle back. The thing that happened, I'm going like, to insult Bioware this whole time so that it like, oh, no. I really want it to happen. Um, if it happens, take a bunch of pictures with me. No. Um, so this is some of my work. Where this, this talk is actually not too much about my work. This is my thesis project. This talk is more um, coming out of my experiences, um, my lived experiences recently as, as queer, and uh, also coming off of um, Southwest PCA, so pop culture media studies and GDC and PAX East and all of this sort of pop culture line stuff that I've been thinking about lately. So I'm going to be talking a lot about that. I'm going to be talking about media in general, deep dive into games, of course all in the context of this Trojan horse narrative structure, um, but you're going to get sort of a broad range of media like, like Heidi was talking about as well. So uh, my, my discipline is um, IMGD in WPI, that's in Massachusetts. Um, and I make different games, obviously some art games, education stuff. Um, I used to be like super boring accounting software person, so I escaped. I escaped from Denver and uh, finally, that's better. Great. So this talk. Um, oh, I should give my content warnings. Bad Photoshop. <laughs> content warning. Um, so, so not much to talk about. A little bit of Doom level gore. Sorry, a little bit of Doom level gore and um, some some nipless femme cleavage, and and that's about it. So. So this talk, um, what I'm going to talk about is a Trojan horse narrative. Sorry. What I'm going to talk about is Trojan horse narrative. And uh, the structure is not anything new, right? But the term uh, is relatively new, or um, we can talk about how it was coined. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about sort of uh, new audiences for Trojan horse and some of the pitfalls of Trojan horse narrative and um, some of the advantages to it, and just some, in general, some of its quirks. And I'm going to try not to make a lot of value judgments in this talk. I'm going to be uh, trying to more open a dialogue um, and, and, not, and not make valuations. And there's reasons for that, and we can talk about that a little bit later as well. So just to, um, to jump into what I'm doing today, uh, agenda from which we will absolutely not be deviating, no matter what, is that untrue? Uh, number one, uh, we will do an introduction. I, I, we did that, so we're doing great. Number two, uh, I'll define this term, and I'll define it sort of in a couple of different ways and through different kinds of uh, media, and I will also define it with examples. Uh, just so you, you'll identify with a lot of these examples, and we already got a lot of examples, and luckily they're not all the same, so uh, we'll have like lots of trajectory to hit this with. I'm gonna talk about problems with this structure, so as makers and creators, we need to know sort of the problems of this, and we also need to know uh, just some of the peculiarities of this structure. Uh, and, and how to talk about it um, in interesting ways. I'm going to talk specifically about us as makers. So um, if you don't feel like a maker, you are a maker. So <laughs> we're over that. OK, good. Uh, we're all makers. We're all here. Uh, we're also going to talk about sort of coming off of being makers. And, um, and I'm going to talk about mod, and I'm going to talk about hack and um, collage as well. So OK. so. Trojan horse narrative was, the term was originally defined by Genji Cohn in relation to the TV adaption of Orange is the New Black, which I'm assuming familiarity with here. Um, this was uh, done in an NPR, a Fresh Air interview, and uh, during, I believe, season one, um, so the adaption, and um, Genji Cohn talks about using Piper Chapman, who is the fictionalized version of the real life Piper Kerman, to be a Trojan horse for narratives that don't get told, which in this talk, I'll be talking about as alternative narratives. And I mean that not evaluatively, but I mean that statistically, narratives that are not popular in mass media and pop, and pop media. So they, these are narratives of, in, in Orange is the New Black, these are narratives of, um, of women of color. These are narratives of uh, women who have lived in poverty. These are narratives of women with different bodies. These are narratives of uh, trans women. These are narratives of women whose lang first language is not English. Uh, these are narratives of women who are convicted of crimes. And these are narratives that don't get told in general. So Genji Kohn is using, Gen Genji Kohn, hmm. uh -huh. do we have another one? Genji, yeah, it's, I think, uh, Genji Kohn is using, yes, 
let's switch. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so Genji Kone is using uh, somebody who is perceived to be really relatable in, in a lot of um, ways media majority, and media majority I mean uh, white and cis, and mostly her, presented mostly as heterosexual to start, um, although that's not the case, that's more the case in the book media than in the, the television media. Um, and somebody who is blonde haired and blue eyed and well to do and Smith educated and very um, English as a first language and cultural English. So this person becomes a vessel of an easy access point, she says, which I think is, is really uh, an important definition of Trojan horse. Um, that is relatable not just to the audience, but also to the network. And we'll talk more about sort of the extra diegetic qualities of Trojan horse. So not only is this Trojan horse person, um, the Piper person, uh, supposed to be very relatable, but also very non-threatening. We're going to see some trends in the kinds of people we see so, uh, that are our vessels as Trojan horses, uh, in, in that they tend to be like hy hyper, made to be almost unrealistically non-threatening in some ways. Uh, and uh, this person is our eyes and ears into a world in which we see alternative narratives take place. And I will, will be focusing on queer narratives. And again, uh, like Heidi mentioned, queer is an umbrella term in this case, uh, but also other types of alternative narratives. And this is, this is generally uh, the sister or brother or best friend or possibly even parent uh, or boss or coworker of the Trojan horse um, who, who is queer or who is uh, a representative of an alternative narrative in some way. So it's defined not only by who the Trojan horse is, but uh, and what we're getting Trojan horse to see, but also who the audience for that is. Because the Trojan horse has to be relatable to that target audience, which I'll be talking about a um, majority pop culture, Western, English-speaking audience today. So let's go through some examples. I'm going to start with non-game media, because they're the most recent examples, um, and they're easier to talk about in some ways. So the first one, obviously, is Orange is the New Black. And this is a great cast photo that I wanted to include, because we've got Piper there in a very playful headlock um, with her blonde hair. And all around her, we have women who um, are immigrants, okay? women who have grown up in poverty, all women who are incarcerated, women whose first language is not English, women who had pregnancies at young ages, women who um, are addicts or were addicts, women who suffer from mental health issues. Um, we even have some, some men in this photo um, that, are, that are also representative of alternative narratives. Um, relationships with immigrants, a man who is uh, uh, differently abled. We have some individuals who are her villains. We have some individuals who are um, more relatable to the, um, in terms of uh, looking at this through, through Piper's eyes. So we have a lot of diversity. Of course, we have um, Laverne Cox, as it has been mentioned, right, um, as trans representation. So another example, and I'm going to talk about like the big names, uh, the trifecta of what I, I think about as being uh, the the very like the big media powerhouses and um, and really good examples of this. So we have Supergirl, whose sister is a uh, lesbian, and we find this out through her eyes, the, her blue eyes and blonde hair and like Americana and apple pie, right? We've got Disney, uh, so there, there are some problems and there's been some, some criticism. I won't make a value judgment about the representation in, in Beauty and the Beast, but uh, oh, I brought a, la a laser for this reason. Trojan horse, <laughs> right? Like Emma Watson, could, Emma Watson could not be like any, like closer to the central, like non-threatening, white, like English-speaking, well-to-do Trojan horse character that we see uh, opening up into different types of narratives. We've got Power Rangers recently. Again, there's been some criticism here, um, not making a value judgment about the um, about the representation of the Yellow Ranger as not being straight, um, in that it extra diegetically might introduce issues of using that as a marketing play to so-called get the queer vote. And that won't be a focus of this talk, but this is another example. Uh, playing on nostalgia. So Beauty and the Beast and a lot of comic book adaptions are playing on nostalgia. Um, and then getting to this. So moving to games, we've got, um, if you saw the keynote yesterday, we've got the, the brown-haired Mel Deval being our Trojan horse for a queer character, We have, uh, which is very personal, right? And then games start to get more personal with this because they're so interactive. We have Gone Home, which has been mentioned many times, and I won't dwell on it, but it's a critical example. Um, 
I actually think Life is Strange is a, is a borderline example, depending on how strongly you feel Maxwell was coded as non-straight in the beginning of the game and um, how we parse multiple endings, but um, also definitely part of this conversation. Uh, any game, uh, like Sandbox game with romance options, um, the, with character customization, so now our interaction is even more personal. Now our interaction isn't just our choices, but it's who we've become in this world, our avatar. Um, I chose an example from Fallout New Vegas, not only because it's a horrible, horrible character creator, one of the worst, uh, but because it featured two queer characters, uh, not romanceable characters, but one played by Felicia Day and one played by Zachary Levi. So uh, at that time, kind of cultural powerhouse voice actors, um, a lesbian character named Veronica, and a bisexual character named Arcade, um, respectively. And we see this as becoming very personal in terms of we're using our player avatar, possibly made in our own image, to interact with these characters. But um, this is something actually Matthew brought up in his talk, that it can become problematic. So wait, I took notes. So he call, you call it polymorphism in terms of the relationship, right? This idea that um, that straight and gay interactions are treated as equally because you can choose your own gender in the game. Uh, I've heard this uh, called player sexuality, like that, uh, that our romance options are not straight or gay or bi, but player sexual. And sort of that as an avoidance of a, a gay or a queer narrative, right? So there's some criticism there I won't touch on too, too much. Um, we've got Overwatch, and this is a really interesting example that's gonna lead into another talk, but um, this is interesting not only because we find out that Tracer is gay through trans media, it is not within the world of the game, but we also find out Tracer is gay extra diegetically, right? So this is through almost marketing material or extra materials, so paratextual material um, to the game. And we also find out uh, later, right? This game has been, been played extensively and then, and then we find out. And this is a, another type of Trojan horse I'm not gonna dwell on. I'm gonna be focusing on the uh, relatable character who ushers a certain audience into other narratives. I'm not gonna so much be talking about the relatable character who becomes that other narrative, but there are many examples of that, right? We've got, um, our, you know, we've got Clark in The 100, we've got Annalise in um, uh, How to Get Away with Making a Murder, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we've got, uh, like, we've got all the way back to Xena, right? Um, uh, and, and, and then Buffy's a hybrid version of this, um, and in some ways so is Supergirl. So, some problems with this. Number one, it's inherently indirect. That's not necessarily a huge problem, but it's definitely something we have to think about. Uh, number two, it absolutely relies on who your audience is, and this is limiting to your narratives, or it can be limiting to your narratives, whether you're constructing these narratives or um, simply talking about them as critics. And lastly, and most problematically, this reinforces the narrative um, the alternative narratives as alternative, right? It reinforces the otherness of the narrative. So we have to be super careful and super aware of this when critiquing these types of structures to say, you know, how much is this representation um, needed in this, in this fashion? Um, and how much is it, is it making the other more other? So, okay. So I would love to give you examples of bad Trojan horses versus good Trojan horses. This is, um, this is actually a piece of artwork that greets you uh, during your arrival to Denver at the airport. It's <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> I love it. So, um, so what I don't have these examples, right? Because as, as uh, both of our speakers mentioned, m examples are mixed. And we can talk about good aspects of Trojan horsing versus bad aspects. So it, at, at its best, it's a way to truly represent real stories to people who may not otherwise be consuming those stories. We, we're talking about people who watch network television and are not as present on the internet and who are more limited in modes of media. Um, we are, we're talking about a, a very, very broad audience. And uh, this can be a great way to represent different types of stories, queer stories, um, or, or other types of stories to these people. But at the same time, there are, there are major pitfalls to that. And one of those pitfalls that, that falls into uh, making the alternative more alternative is tokenism. So one of the problems, and, and you'll hear narrative people say this a lot, like they're a stock character, they only get really one trait, right? So, so their one trait is that they're gay. Well, that's 
a logical fallacy because you would never say their one trait is that they're black or their one trait is that they're Asian or their one trait is that they're overweight, right? You would never say that. But somehow like queer gets under the radar um, because it's not always treated as something that's not a choice. So we have to be really, really careful to call, it, to call that out and say, if you're gonna make a stock character, you base that character on something that is a, a chosen way of living. And not only is that more honest, but it's more interesting. Because it's not interesting to have a stock character that's based on something that person didn't choose, right? It's, it, it becomes a meaningless sort of stock character. So I love this quote uh, by Felix Gonzalez Torres, who is a famous artist. And um, it's about how he's, he thinks he's a terrible token because he doesn't wear the right clothing, right? And so uh, I thought this was just a really uh, good insight into that. So, okay, so some non, not necessarily negative aspects of children horse narrative, but um, some quirks of it. So, one thing that people feel a lot about uh, talking about this is, I my faves are problematic, right? Like I like this thing and it has problems, and how, how can I talk about that and, and justify it to myself even privately? And there's this great book called Disidentifications by Minas, and it's about how you can kind of recapitulate media in, in your own image, or that you can recycle imagery um, to expand it beyond its toxicity. That it's a, not always an act of reclaiming or recycling, but it's a strategy that is neither totally accepting of media nor totally eschewing of that media, right? Um, it, it's, it's a way, this, is, this book is from 1999, and, but it's a way to say, I accept this, the problems with this narrative, um, but still identify with many things about it. We're gonna come back to this the book a couple times. So another great thing that I wanna talk about, another quirk of Trojan Horse Media is um, that it, audiences are inherently lazy, right? And um, it's easy for audiences to say, well, like, I watched Supergirl, and there was like, totally gay chick on Supergirl, so like, I'm good. And Ananthropy um, definitely like warns us against this, right? Like. Um, that, that including the representation and experiencing it is not allyhood. Um, so that's something when talking critically about Trojan Horse Narrative that's really important to remember. So our role as makers. Um, so I talked a lot about critique, Trojan Horse Narrative critique, right? But I, I haven't talked about us as makers too much. So what is advice for, for crafting these narratives to, um, to bring in queer characters to audiences who may not have access to them? Um, and like make the narratives you want to make and like do even if they're gonna be bad like just make one just like do it all right i'm really like really over this <laughs> um it was mentioned actually in the the keynote today in the q a session uh that uh, this is problematic because it absolves makers in a lot of ways of responsibility for their own narratives um, and i also think it's problematic because making is hard and I'm not going to stand here and tell you guys to like make something right now, right? So instead, I, I kind of want to talk about changing the game, like literally changing the game, um, and bring it sort of into mod culture and collaging. So to me, the, the ethics of modding, uh, you know, that from the roots of games, we're actually are going to talk about Doom a little, but um, right from the root, the, the ethic of hacking and modding is the ethic of a disidentification, right? Is, is recapitulating something you love in a different way um, without destroying it or uh, holding it up as perfect. So it's a, very, it's a very good middle ground. And talking about digital collage and taking artifacts, um, there's this great new David Kanaga game called Oiko Spiel. Yes, yeah, I know. I thanked him for it. GDC is wonderful. Um, that just it is like just rips pieces out of other things, right? And is like issues as copyright and stuff. Um, and this is a great way to co-opt um, toxic representation. And there are a lot of tools out there for media changing, not just media making. And it can be much easier and much faster and much more satisfying immediately to do this. So there used to be a lot of mods like this. There was a mod called Femdoom. This is a, a picture from Femdoom that changed the main character of Doom to a woman. And there was even updates to change all the voice acting, right? There was a mod called Super Daisy Brothers. Uh, and Anthropy writes about both of these in uh, Rise of the Zinesters. It's really good. Uh, and, and this was a part, an integral part of gaming culture in the beginning, and now we've got what? We've got like body mods, right? Um, I'm a Fallout 4 modder, and I want to be real proud of that, but my things are problematic too, because CBBE is the number one mod for Fallout 4, and it is a very large modded community, okay? And CBBE stands for 
I'm gonna get it wrong. Caliente is beautiful body enhancements. And you can imagine what types of bodies are enhanced and how they are enhanced. Uh, and so that's like a problem. And there, there aren't any like, I don't know, there are a lot of like gun mods and, and body slide mods. And so like, uh, <laughs> that's my feeling on that. Um, so coming back, to dis coming back to disidentifications and recycling and rethinking as cracking the code in here, it was 1999, he's not literally talking about code, but I'm gonna make it literal. Um, cracking the code of the majority and taking that raw material um, and representing disempowered politics without a direct clash, without a direct acceptance, but instead a pivot. Um, and I think that's a way to address Trojan horse because there are problems with keeping it uh, with keeping the other other, but there are advantages with showing a whole new dimension to people who aren't like us because I always forget they aren't all like us. So uh, as media makers, and, and even if, if, you know, if we consider ourselves very niche, you know, lots of people consume lots of media and, and, and our work can't be seen by many. So that is my takeaway. Thank you so much. Thanks.